everyone. Hello. Welcome. We're so excited to have you guys here on this Thursday evening. My name is McKaylee. I work with Tattered Cover Bookstore, which is located in Denver, Colorado, for those who might not know. And I just, I'm so excited to be here. I, you know, we've been doing these virtual events now for a while, since March, and we're going to probably keep doing them for a long time. So for those of you who are out there joining us, and this is your, uh, not your first rodeo, not your first virtual event, thanks for coming back. Thank you for joining us again. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, welcome to our virtual community that we've created here. Tattered Cover has always thought of itself as a community space. And while we may not be able to gather physically together, um, we are just really grateful to have this virtual community that is growing and expanding. So thank you guys for your continued support so that we can have awesome author events like this one. And I also just want to introduce Tattered Cover because for some people who might not ever have been to the Denver metro area or you might not live in Colorado, you might not have heard of this uh, local independent bookstore. We have over four, not over, excuse me, exactly four locations in the Denver metro area. And we are turning 50, 5 in 2021. So we've been around since 1971, which is a huge deal for an independent bookstore. And the only reason we're still around is because of the community support and the fact that people continue to support local businesses. So we cannot thank you guys enough for that. I want to just do a couple of housekeeping things like the fact that Tattered Cover has all four of our stores open right now. Um, so you can come in and visit us for about 90 minutes or so, as long as you wear your mask over your mouth and your nose. And you can come in and visit with hand sanitizer and gloves if you so do desire. Come and pick out a book um, or two or gifts. Get your holiday shopping early. We all know that November is the new December. Um, but if you want to stay inside, shop in your pajamas, or you're not in the Denver metro area, you can always shop online with us. And our website, tatteredcover.com, is open 24-7. So we'd love to see you guys on in person or to see your orders online. And thank you again for continuing to support local businesses. I want to also let you know that closed captioning is enabled for those who might need it. The way to uh, enact that is to, on the screen you're watching me on right now, just hover your mouse and there's a black bar at the bottom. There's a button that says CC on it. If you click that button, closed captioning is enabled for those who might want it or need it. So we just wanted to give you a quick instruction on that as well. So now it is my honor to welcome the authors of the hour here. And so we are here to celebrate uh, Denise Kiernan's new book. And uh, she's then going to be in conversation with Neil Thompson. So a little bit about Neil. Neil Thompson is a journalist and the author of five highly acclaimed books, including A Curious Man, Driving with the Devil, The Fatherhood and Skateboarding Memoir, Kickflip Boys. His next book, The First Kennedys, An Immigrant Maid, her bartender son, and the humble roots of a dynasty will be published in fall of 2021. He has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Esquire, Outside, Oprah.com, and more, and has taught creative nonfiction at Hugo House and Great Smokies Writing Program. He lives in Seattle with his family. And then now we have the author of the hour here, Denise Kiernan. Denise is an author, journalist, and producer. Her last book, The Last Castle, was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and paperback, and was also a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Her previous title, The Girls of Atomic City, is a New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and NPR bestseller, and has been published in multiple languages. She also has worked in television, serving as head writer for ABC's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire during its Emmy Award-winning first season, and has produced for media outlets such as ESPN and MSNBC, as well as for independent productions. She lives in North Carolina, and we're here to celebrate her newest book, We Gather Together. So it's my honor to welcome both Neil and Denise, and I'm gonna have them join me and turn on their videos here. And there's Denise, hello! Hi. And Neil, welcome! Hi, it's great to be here. Hi, Michaela. Thank Thanks for the great intros. Yes, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. It's your accolades. I'm just reading them off. You're the ones who accomplished all those things. So. But you did a great job reading them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Was Thank great you. Saying. Yes. Well, Denise, I'd love it if you could just start off really quickly with a short summary about what we gather together is about, and then I'll let you two take the conversation from there and I'll hop off until it's time for the Q&A. Oh my God, I can't do that. No. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so funny when you write a book because 
you you spend all these years conceiving it and then you spend more years writing it and editing it and revising it and then it's like give us a brief summary of your, summary of your book and you're thinking what no i wrote a book <laughs> for <laughs> i couldn't so, do it in a minute <laughs> yeah totally um so uh we gather together is it's it's really a look at it's really a look at america through the experience of giving thanks so uh, we're looking at Thanksgiving, but it, it really goes back further than that and into the future. Um, and we sort of look at America as a country, um, actually America before it was a country, pre-colonial times. Um, and we come all the way up through uh, the 21st century. And we sort of look at the concept of gratitude on this continent um, and others, and then how American Thanksgiving with like the big T came to be um, in the midst of the Civil War and how that tradition has continued into the 21st century and how that has evolved and changed over time. And um, there are some really interesting characters throughout the book. Uh, one of the main characters is a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale who was obsessed with the idea of the entire country coming together and giving thanks on the same day. And she petitioned, wrote about it for years in novels and in her magazines and petitioned uh, presidents to make this day uh, a holiday. Uh, when she was petitioning presidents uh, to make this a holiday, the only national holidays were um, Washington's birthday and the 4th of July. So she wanted uh, everybody to come together. The, the president that finally answered her call, so to speak, was Lincoln in 1863 in the midst of the Civil War. So one of the things that kind of got me, I had heard about Hale for a while, but I'm not a biographer. I don't really write biographies. Um, but I was interested, as I always am, in sort of like the juxtaposition of events as opposed to just the events themselves. So I thought it was kind of interesting that you had the seeds of our kind of annual tradition of Thanksgiving sort of taking root in the midst of the Civil War when everybody was feeling so divided. And that seemed really interesting to me. And then the missing piece that finally made me want to kind of do this book, because I was sort of trying to figure out my way in for a while, um, was the gratitude piece. So again, see, you asked me like a short description of my book and can't <laughs> Can't do it. Sorry. Hey, that That's is why awesome. Neil is here because he's gonna just like he's no. gonna drill down and get it out of me. Just keep going, Denise. I'll sit here with Michaela. <laughs> well, and I'm gonna pop out to... and let the two of you take this show over. And um, like I said before, um, audience members, keep your questions in your head, and I'll pop back in after their conversation so that we uh, can have Neil and Denise answer your questions. Take it away, you two. Thank cool. you. Thanks, Michaela. Hi, Neil. Oh, hi, Denise. How are you? I'm good. How are you? As I mentioned earlier, I, I am a, a big fan of your background there. It's very Oh, thing. thank you very much. It's, it's, it's amazing. Fun. Like we used to just, you know, oh my God, I have to get on a plane and check into a hotel. And, you know, if it's Tuesday, it must be Tulsa. And now it's, I hope I don't trip over my ring light. And where should I put the flowers? Like it, it's a very <laughs> different, it's a very different kind of of tour now, but I'm very, I'm, I'm very grateful. We can even, we can even do this. And honestly, you and I might not be able to do this if it weren't for the virtual tour thing. Exactly. Since I abandoned yeah. you in Asheville. Uh, yeah, I don't, don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. <laughs> it's fine. I'm over so, it. So um, I'm going to pile onto your summary of the book and just add a couple things. Cause I think it's really, um, for those who are watching and thinking about buying it, and you should, um, it's it's really incredibly, and I'm sure you meant this, but it's it's so timely and so relevant and so like such a book for now. All, you know, all these all these pieces it carries all these messages that I think we all need to hear right now about who we are as a nation and, a, and a, as a people, what our capacity is to kind of come together during difficult times. Um, what does it mean to be uh, grateful, period. Um, and, and, I, and I just love all that in addition to loving the characters and the historical bits um, as someone who 
is researching some some similar periods of American history. I loved a lot of the overlap with some of the things that I've come across. So I want to jump right in. Um, let's let's start with uh, uh, Sarah Hale. And uh, uh, you gave a little bit of a description of knowing about her story for a while. She was a journalist. You're a journalist. I'm a journalist. Like. I wondered if that was what initially drew you to her. And I wonder if you could talk too about uh, a little bit more about the evolution of you finding her story and, and, and what it meant to you. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's I, I honestly, I don't remember when I first came across Sarah Josepha Hale in particular. Um, I think it was when I, I was working on something else. You know how it is when you're researching something else and you're, you go through so many documents and so many articles and so many things, and then you see a name or a person and you think, huh, that's kind of interesting. And what I always do is I just keep, I keep so many files um, of ideas. And by idea, I mean, it could be a post-it stuck on the wall. It could be um, a photo that I stick in, you know, Dropbox. It could be, it could be anything. Um, and when I came across her story, and she was interesting to me because this was a person who in the 19th century, you know, had no formal schooling and uh, was widowed with five kids and, and went on to be one of the most influential editors, um, you know, in the 19th century. And as a woman, as a woman without a formal education, as a woman struggling to support her family, I found that really compelling. Um, however, like I, you know, like I said, I didn't really want to do a biography, but the whole, uh, her petitioning and finally connecting with Lincoln, um, was really interesting to me, but I still couldn't sort of like find a way into the story. Um, she was so, I, I, she was one of those people when I was researching her, I just thought she did so much. She wrote novels. She published other people's work. She did anthologies. She wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. I mean, we've all heard of Mary Had and a we'll Little And we'll come back to that one. Yeah. Um, There's so many gems like that. That's what I so love about the many, story. She published, she raised money for, um, for uh, the widows of people lost at sea. She, you know, raised money for Revolutionary War monuments. She uh, was constantly kind of doing for others while she was pretty much trying to, you know, support herself and her family. And she published a lot of people before they were well known, including, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, she was really kind of, she was this, she was like this OG influencer, you know? I mean, she was, you know, you take Kim Kardashian and put her in the 19th century and have her petitioning, you know, presidents to start a holiday. And you've got Sarah Josepha Hale, except she just, Sarah Josepha Hale just wore black and, and, you know, had crinolites and bustles and all that sort of stuff. But no um, Instagram. Yeah, which is no not Instagram at the time. Yeah, no <laughs> Instagram. Um, uh, so she, I found her very compelling in that way. And uh, the fact that she was a female journalist and, and, and being a female journalist, that was also something that I, I, I was really interested in the idea of the role that media played in, in cultural development and the role that the media played in relation to the presidency mm -hmm. and the role that you know, media played in popularizing ideas, whether it be white wedding dresses or Christmas trees, both of which she helped popularize in her magazine. Um, and those two ideas seem to have stuck around for a while um, to, you know, actually creating a holiday. And so the media aspect of this was also really, really um, interesting to me. So, uh, but, you know, you talk about it being timely and what's so funny, and you know, this is, when you conceive of what you think you want to be a book to be and you pitch it and then, you know, it gets tweaked and you write it and you revise it. I mean, all of that stuff happens and you have no idea what the world is going to look like when that book is published. I had no idea the world was going to look like this you didn't when I was writing this, this book. <laughs> 
but I think it's because that ideas like, like gratitude um, are so timeless and so important and resonate so much with people that, um, that I think it, it still feels um, timely, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think that that piece of it is probably what allowed her to uh, get the ear of uh, influential people at certain times along the way. And I, and in particular, I'm curious about Lincoln. Um, and, you know, it's hard to imagine now a journalist and the president of the United States cooperating Just on anything. Eye to eye and saying, let's do something. Yeah. Forget about it. Right. So, yeah, so t- if, talk a little bit about what, as far as you were able to uh, research, what did Lincoln think of her? Why did she, why did she, get his attention and, and why did he help? It, Seward was, um, you know, Seward was a big part of that. She wrote him as well. Um, and, you know, I think, I mean, I, 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 I wish I could have found, you know, as we do research on these things, it's, you want that one, that one letter moment. that says, I love Sarah Josepha Hale because dot 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 <laughs> love Abraham Lincoln. But you never see them, but you never seem to find those things. But um, I I feel as though he was, you know, he was probably looking for um, you know, a way to kind of get people to coalesce around something that they could probably all get behind. Um, she had, she had, you know, petitioned four other presidents before him, all of whom kind of, you know, ignored her request to establish this holiday. She had been, um, writing governors and ambassadors, um, and the heads of, uh, territories and other parts of what was then the, you you know, parts, parts of the United States that weren't states yet, um, asking them to kind of get on board with her idea of, hey, we all sort of do these things because Thanksgiving was, you know, yeah, this year, uh, you know, Massachusetts, we're going to have it in, you know, we're going to have it in October this year because when the harvest is coming in and New York is like, yeah, we're going to have ours in November and this Connecticut, yeah, we're going to do December. And she just said, you know, let's, let's, we want it to all, we want it to be on the same day um, and everybody and all together. And there was this, I think, um, and I have no evidence that the two of them ever met in person. However, um, her daughter's brother-in-law did know Lincoln, um, uh, General, uh, General Hunter. And uh, so the possibility of her having met him does exist. I just could never find proof that she did. Yeah. Um, so, but they, you know, she, her father was a Revolutionary War uh, veteran. And she loved the union. She didn't want to see the United States break apart. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was very vocal about the idea that he did not want the United States to break apart. So uh, I think without sort of, you know, uh, getting together in person and, you know, conspiring to make this thing happen, when she wrote this letter to him and also wrote, um, you know, Seward separately. And then, you know, Seward approached Lincoln and said, you know, we should, we should do this. And Lincoln was like, yeah, let's do it. And responded very quickly, like, you know, within, within a couple of weeks of, you know, of receiving her letter, he had issued the proclamation that, you know, the end of November was going to be, um, a national day of Thanksgiving. And it was one week um, after he gave the Gettysburg Address. So it was, you know, on the heels of some really difficult, um, you know, the commemoration of a, of a really horrific, um, difficult loss for, for all, for everybody in the country. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, thought that juxtaposition was interesting too. And, and I think it's one of the, the, the strengths of the book, or uh, at least for me personally, again, because I'm exploring some of this same time period, and I love the cameos by different yeah. figures uh, from that 
time period, writers, especially who she published or worked with, um, you know, Frederick Douglass, Emerson Whitman, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Sojourner Truth. Like, I, I just love uh, uh, reliving that, that period of time, both before and after the Civil War, where, um, I don't know, literature at the time was sort of having a, a, a moment in, in, in the US. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then after the Civil War, we sort of found our footing again as a nation. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of those characters. Was there anyone in particular who you thought you knew, but you learned something else about, somebody who surprised you, or did you have a favorite? Um, talk about some of those folks who pop up now and again in the book. For me, it's the inner, it, it's those intersections of events that I find really um, interesting. When so Hale's Hale's son David went to West Point with Edgar Allan Poe. And um, she published some of Poe's earliest work before anybody knew who he was. And uh, the, review, the, the review in the magazine, um, you know, had said that, you know, his prose was boyish and um, this, that, and the other, but that he showed real signs of genius. And there's a letter uh, that I talk about in the book when her son David said, I, 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 I told my classmate, um, you know, Edgar about what you said. And, you know, and, and it was just interesting. And she had a, a relationship with Poe that continued on until the, the end of his life. In fact, um, her magazine, Godies, was the first to publish the cask of, a, of a Amontillado. And, um, so that sort of stuff, those intersections were really interesting to me. And you talked about where writing was at this point. And this was sort of the early, the early time of the professional writer when writers were actually starting to get paid uh, to write and could start to you know, make a living from their writing. Um, she published and actually edited um, alongside uh, uh, for Lydia Maria Child. Um, who's a remarkable, remarkable woman. Um, and, and then there were just aspects of Thanksgiving, not necessarily Hale, because the book does, you know, go forward into the 20th and 21st century um, that were really interesting. The, uh, you know, the Massachusetts 54th, which was the, you know, the first all black regiment, um, you know, in the military, in the civil war, the, I, that, that regiment, the seeds of that regiment were planted at a Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, and it, that was one of those things that I found out kind of later um, after I'd done the first draft of the book and I was like, oh my God, I got to fit this in here somewhere. Um, it, you know, Sojourner Truth going door to door um, to raise money to be able to bring a uh, Thanksgiving dinner to troops. Uh, you know, all these different ways in which uh, people came together to do what they could for this holiday that th this holiday that it's sort of been wasn't a national holiday yet. It was, you know, it was more regional, depending on where you were. Um, and finding all of those little little stories were really, really fascinating. And then coming into the 20th century, Looking at Thanksgiving during the uh, the pandemic, during the Spanish flu, ask about was, was very interesting <laughs> initially just because I thought it was interesting. And then when I was editing and revising the book, it was early 2020 and it was, oh, wow, this reads very differently right now because mm -hmm. we're all in the midst of, we're about to go into a Thanksgiving in the midst of a of a pandemic. So that took on a whole other level of um, whole other weight, um, it, which is one of those things where like you, you can write a book and you never know how it's going to land or the world is going to land in. And uh, I just finished reading uh, uh, related to this Emma Donahue, uh, Irish writer, her new book, her new book, it's back here somewhere, The Pull of the Stars. And mm -hmm. it's about, uh, it's about the same influenza. Spanish flu pandemic told, told through a, a maternity ward in Dublin in oh. 1918. And she started the book well before we, any of us heard of COVID or coronavirus. Um, yeah. and I, I'm just fascinated by that. Um, um, but it, but you, in your case, it's another example of all these little nuggets that make this book so 
timely and relevant and meaningful today in all these different ways. Um, I want to like jump way ahead. Um, you and I talked earlier about um, how this is not just Sarah Joseph Hale's story. What, no, what, yeah. what, what mattered to you was really getting at deeply at this idea of gratitude as it relates to sort of the American story. Um, and I want to get your thoughts, um, uh, I guess a little bit on, on that idea, how it fits into who we are as a nation and, and how you're thinking about it now as we're about to go into Thanksgiving, as we're in a really tricky time here in America, um, no matter where you stand on things. Um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on what that, that idea of gratitude can do to pull us through difficult times? And, and, I, and I wanna to add to that too, you know, gratitude is also having kind of a moment um, yeah. within the meditation world and mindfulness and this idea that if you just wake up and you're thankful for what you have and take a moment to say that to yourself or to whoever, it's good for your health, it's good for your sanity and we all need that right now. So talk a little bit about gratitude, capital G. Yeah, that is what you were just saying was actually the final puzzle piece that made me think, okay, I think I know what I want, that I want to do this book and that I want to do this book um, now. So the gratitude piece was really important to me because one of the things that I found um, one of the things I found interesting about Hale is how tenacious she was. And, you know, this was a woman who, you know, was widowed. She needed to earn a living. This was not an extremely wealthy woman. Um, and, uh, you know, she really worked to better herself and in the meantime, kept bettering the lives of others. And she was behind a holiday for, she wanted everybody to come together on the same day and say, thank you. Um, Lincoln got on board with that in the midst of a civil war when everyone in this country was just was as divided as they ever have as they ever have been. Um, but focusing just on the civil war didn't in that era, Hale and Lincoln still didn't work for me, which is why when I had those pieces, I, I still wasn't quite sure I, I wanted to do this book or how I would do this book. Um, but then, you know, it was, I kept thinking about the idea of gratitude. And in the last, you know, 10, 20 years, there has been so much research, serious research, neurological research, psychiatric research into the benefits, physical, mental, emotional, of having a, a gratitude practice, of being appreciative of things in your daily life. And in fact, the power of being appreciative of things and grateful for things when, not when things are going great, but when they're not going great is yeah. actually, you know, all the more uh, poignant and powerful. And I thought about grad, and, and to me, that was the linchpin. And I thought about gratitude as a very, because gratitude has been, people have been giving thanks uh, since they've been walking on this planet. So the idea of gratitude and the idea of rituals of Thanksgiving goes back centuries upon centuries upon centuries, um, long before the United States was even an idea. And so I, I knew that that was kind of the thread that was going to tie all of this together, um, you know, which is why I go way back in the book, you know, to like ancient Rome and before um, and come forward and I and the the gratitude piece to me is what made me say okay i want to do this i want to do this book now that was that was what made it work for for me because i i what i didn't want to just do a book about um thanksgiving and the civil war and how it yeah. came to be that i didn't want to do and it, it is you know time and time again um and it's a, you know, it's a big movement now. And um, there's so much scientific research supporting the power of actually taking time to just say thank you for whatever it is in your life that you are grateful for. And it's such a personal thing. Like one person might be grateful for the fact that they have food that day. Another person might be grateful that, you know, 
someone they loved had a peaceful death. I mean, you know, I mean, there are so many different things and it's, sure. yeah. it's all very personal, which is what makes it so powerful because anyone has access to it at any time. And so to me, the idea that you could, you know, the idea that there is a, a holiday set aside in truth, in essence, for saying thank you together is a big thing. And that's, I mean, it, it, it's in a, in a very, very simple way. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So I just kind of looked at that idea, you know, over a couple centuries and, you know, that essence, I think, you know, is, is still there now. One more question from me, and then we're going to uh, take some audience questions virtually. Um, on that idea of gratitude, I, I, I'd love to know going into this weird Thanksgiving, what are you grateful for besides your beautiful husband, Joe? <laughs> like what's, what's, He's watching. What's, he will love that you called him beautiful. Um, <laughs> what's in your head right now? And, and, and I guess tied to that, do you have a, a gratitude practice or what do you, what do you th I think? I do. I have, I have a, I, I do have a gratitude journal. Um, I wish I were better about actually writing in it every day. <laughs> Part of that is because I write in a journal journal every day. So, and I often in there, you know, write things that I'm, you know, trying to be, you know, want to be thankful for. Um, it has been, uh, you know, I think before we even went live today, I was talking to McKaylee and said, you know, this is, I, I, I love tattered cover. I wish I were there physically, but, you know, I'm really grateful that we have all figured out a way to kind of make the best of what is going on in the world right now. And I feel really fortunate that, you know, I mean, if you've got food on your table and a roof over your head and people who care for you and people that you care for, you know, I mean, what more do you, what more do you need? I mean, this is on this planet. And so I am, I am, I am grateful. I am grateful for all that. I'm grateful for you, Neil Thompson. <laughs> Back no, at seriously. you. Seriously. Like this is this, seriously, I mean, these are the kinds of things it's like, wow, this is the weirdest book launch I've ever had in my like 20, I don't even want to talk about closer to 30 <laughs> years of working as a writer, but you know what? It's, it's okay. And I'm grateful for you because you're making it even more okay. Ah, uh, that's sweet. Uh, that sweet. No. So, I mean, it's, it's all those sorts of things, but, but seriously, it's, um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be thankful for. I think a lot of writers are feeling some similar emotions, you know, especially those with books coming out or, or about to come out in my case. Um, it's been a rough year on so many levels, but you know, when you get down to it, like you said, if you've got people who you care about and care about you, roof over your head, you're safe, you're healthy. It's all that yeah. matters. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think this book is going to help us remember those things and appreciate what we have. Thank you. I, I didn't intend it to land in the middle of a pandemic when we all needed to be reminded of these things, but I think it, I think it could, I think it could. I'm grateful for now knowing who I need to blame for white wedding dresses. Um, but, <laughs> for, my, for my feminist talking here. Uh, but <laughs> oh, I, I elope. Don't even, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I, right? yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me, this woman? Yeah. Um, but no, I, I loved that in the book too. Neil mentioned it, just like the little nuggets about who this woman was. And I'm like, where is her movie? And why oh, do we not have it? You. Like, come on. Um, so I, Thank you both for that lovely conversation. And it's, it's always so nice when the um, two authors know each other and they can just riff off very easily. It makes it <laughs> so entertaining. Like we're flies on the walls at your coffee date. So we just thank <laughs> you for that. And um, we were behaving. Yes, you were doing great. You did you a great behaving. job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm only drinking tea and kombucha here. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is water. We could have a whole other author conversation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, author coffee hour at some point. Dark web. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's 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 get some questions from our audience members here. So if you're watching us right now, off to the right hand side, there's a chat feature that you guys can type your questions into for either Neil, Denise, or both. And I think this is a really good one to start off with. Denise what was the research process like for this book? Because having to cover such a breadth of 
history, <laughs> even though you had a common thread to follow, what was the research process like for you? And can I just say thank you to the questioner because I wanted to ask research questions, but I didn't want to nerd out too much on the <laughs> private research. You know, so, we, uh, we often have nerdy viewers who want to know everything about writing process to great. research to like, again, I'm sure somebody would have asked the grateful question. We get a lot of weird questions around here. So that's a good one. Though. Take it away. I will nerd out all day. <laughs> so my, my process is, it's not the same for every book, but in the initial stages of any book, I cast a pretty, I cast a pretty wide net um, because often what happens and with this book in particular is I become interested in one aspect of the book, but I haven't decided that's what the book is. So okay. I came across Hale's story and I thought, huh, that's interesting. So um, I bought a couple of old biographies of hers, um, you know, going back, you know, back quite a ways um, to just sort of read about her and, okay, that's interesting. Um, and then, you know, uh, you can dig into the, the National Archives has wonderful, like all presidential proclamations you can actually look into. Um, going back to uh, when people like John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were proclaiming Thanksgivings and Samuel Adams, because there's that whole, I, I do get into the, the pre-holiday, um, uh, thanks, when Thanksgiving was sort of a, we're gonna have a Thanksgiving because uh, you know, of the repeal of the, the, the Stamp Act. We're gonna have a Thanksgiving because, you know, uh, you know, we won this battle. We're going to have a thanks get, we're going to have a day of fasting and humiliation. That was a favorite, um, <laughs> for you, you, there were all these sorts of things and, and the presidential documents that are available on that through the Adams archives, through the national archives, um, a, a number of different places. I can read like old documents for days and actually stopping researching is one of the harder things to do. But one of my favorite things um, is actually touching old stuff. So I actually have a bound copy of all of Go Godey's magazine, the magazine that um, ha Sarah Josepha Hale edited, wow. in which she constantly was talking, you know, writing about Thanksgiving, etc. I have the 1860 and 1860, uh, 1863, which was the year that Lincoln agreed to um, proclaim uh, Thanksgiving a national holiday. I have an, an original of all of those bound. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's pretty great. And you can touch, you can just all the articles and the paper's so old and it's just so beautiful. So I, I do a lot of that kind of old paper stuff, um, it, which I love and I, I, I do more than I need to. So I, I feel like you kind of go wide and then you sift depending on which direction you get pulled into. And I love old newspapers because there is something about just seeing like, what was on the front page of the paper then? Like, what did they care? What did they care about? Not just pertaining to your story, but you know, you often hear, um, especially uh, uh, science fiction and fantasy writers will, will talk about the importance of world building Narrative nonfiction writers have to do that too. Same thing, and, yeah. And we have to, if you really want to make your nonfiction book feel like, feel like a novel, you've got to pull people into your story. I mean, nobody wants to, you know, read about Frodo if they don't have a big feeling about Middle Earth. Well, nobody Absolutely. wants to read about anything nonfiction if they don't have a feeling about that particular moment in time. And um, old newspapers and old magazines are great in that way of just advertisements there's That's some what I was going to say. There's one of my favorite, one of my favorite podcasts when they do a certain uh, special spinoff that they do, they'll read the sales of oh, old yeah. newspapers oh, and yeah. like talk about the old sales, which are so absurd. I'm oh my curious. gosh. Yeah. I have a couple from um, when we start to get into how Thanksgiving evolved and we get mm -hmm. into gimbals in Philly, which had the Thanksgiving parade before Macy's did. Macy's, yeah. And they talk about like, come to Gimbal's, have your kid ride on real ponies. I was like, they had real ponies in Gimbal's? What was going on there? What is this place? And, you know, what, you know, silk bloomers and, you know, 
what people were charging for different kinds of things. I love that sort of stuff. And it really does make you feel, um, it makes you feel like you're in that moment in time. It is time traveling. It yes, really absolutely. Is. Neil, do you have the same kind of philosophy in your books? Do you start wide and then sift down? Do you, or do you kind of just go with the flow where your interest? Or you're like, I'm going to go after this thing. Yeah. Or do you're like, I, this is my thing. You know, well, what is it like for you as a writer? It, it varies from book to book. I know that's a cop out, but it, but it really does. Um, I, I like initially going for the thing. Like, mm-hmm. what am I really trying to get at? What do I, what, what's my, um, uh, you know, um, what, what's my real goal here? And I try and get that thing. And then I start to build the world around that. Um, but, I, but I will say this. Uh, so the bulk, I'm working on a new book. It's about the Kennedy family or the immigrant Kennedys, the first Kennedys who came to America um, just before the time period that Denise is writing about, 19, uh, 1840s. And so the book takes place in, in, in this period of the 1840s through early 1900s. Um, I started the going deeper in my research in February of this year with plans to travel to Dublin and Boston and DC and all these other places. And obviously um, that didn't pan out. What has been fascinating and a huge relief to me is how much I've been able to find and how much of that world building I've been able to accomplish digitally. Like these online archives that I never knew existed. Um, store. <laughs> yeah, oh, hey, totally. Hey, happy trust. Go happy, happy trust. trust. And you know, the Mormons. Oh they my have God. Oh yeah, yeah. Digitized yeah, yeah. everything. And without uh, you know, ancestry.com, myheritage.com, familysearch.com, all these things that primarily give me access uh, not just to the genealogical stuff that I wanted, but to newspapers and other archives. Yeah. I'd I'd be screwed without it. So it's been really fascinating slash frustrating to research yeah. a book during a pandemic. Yeah. Well, speaking of books and research, um, Denise, I know this is a hard question to ask, especially since you literally just published a book, but are you working on something new? Has something else caught your interest in your plethora of research? Oh, yes. No, this book, here's what's funny. This book, this book, supposed to be was not supposed to be the book I was doing now. It was supposed to be the book I was doing next. Okay. And the book, <laughs> the book I'm doing now slash next was supposed to be the one I was going to do flipper. first. Yeah. There are a number of reasons why this came first and the other one didn't. However, I was supposed to be on the road because there is an element of on the road for my next book. Ooh. Oh, it's a fun one. Um, Rick's adventures. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, and I couldn't. So, <laughs> so I'm like, so, um, but yes, um, another narrative nonfiction history, um, actually going back even further than this one. So I, I keep going, I went from like World War II to the <laughs> so Golden bad. Age to the 19th century and I'm going back into the 18th century mostly for the next one. So, um, the, uh, yes. So I, okay, yes, that's okay. You don't have, have, I usually have ideas. I usually have ideas stacked, but the thing is like when you're supposed to do them changes all the time. It, it just, sometimes you get, I mean, I don't know if Neil, if you go through this too, but sometimes you just sort of get a feeling like, nope, this isn't the right time for this. And it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean you don't like the idea any more or less than you did. It's just, you start to feel pulled in a different, and I don't know if that comes from Neil and I both come out of journalism. And I don't know if it comes from that kind of, um, the, the, the timeliness or what feels right about a story. I don't know, Neil, what do you? Some sort of you know instinct I mean? sometimes, but I think it's, it's vital and doesn't always happen that you have to listen to that inner voice you know, if something's tapping on the shoulder and saying, you know, it might not be the right time for this. Um, there was a book I did years ago um, uh, about a high school football team after Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the story is, is wonderful, but the, the, um, the timing turned, we tried to uh, publish the book two years after uh, Katrina, thinking that people might 
uh, be ready for a, a sort of an anniversary story? No way. It was just awful timing. And I sort of knew that. I believed in the story. I wish I had more time to research it and go a little deeper and didn't rush to publication. So it's not exactly what you're talking about in terms of bailing on a story because it doesn't feel like the right time. But similarly, it just, it wasn't the right time. I kind of knew it and, uh, um, and didn't listen to that voice. I think there is, I have two really great questions here before we close out that I just can't pick one. So we're going to do both. But they're both for both. They're both for both of you. That's weird. Uh, that what advice do you have for writers wanting to craft not narrative nonfiction stories? Because I think that there's such a art to it and you all have already given us such great advice about the world building and, you know, following your instincts, but, if you could give another another little nugget of inspiration and, and advice to writers, what would you what would you say? I'll I'll give a general piece of advice and a nerdy process piece of advice. So my general my general piece of advice would be, and this sounds kind of stupid and obvious, but pick something you're really curious about. Um, and interested in because these things are in your life for a long time <laughs> yeah. and you like I am still as interested in women who worked on the Manhattan Project as I was when I was doing Girls of Atomic City mm -hmm. I'm still as interested in when you know uh, the Gilded Age gave way to the Industrial Age as I was when I was doing The Last Castle and I still find, you know, the, the idea of how customs and traditions and holidays evolve and the culture that grows up around them. I, I, it, it's, that's a lot, kind of a lifelong fascination for me, but be really, it's very easy. It's actually, it, 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 it's easy to get pulled into and hard to avoid the idea of what's the smart thing to do? What's the smart story to write? What's the thing that needs to be, you have to go with something that really, really hooks you um, as a reader because you are gonna be st stuck with that stuck thing with it, yeah. as a researcher and a writer for a long time. And if you don't feel passionate or curious about it, you're not gonna be able to convey that either through your writing or when you're actually having to promote it. And the, and the nerdy process thing is, just write a really crappy first draft. Yeah, that's really a crappy. I mean, advice. horrible and um, just shameful. Like something you would <laughs> never show any. I never show anyone my first draft. I show my husband, who's also an author, um, my second draft. The but beautiful I mean, Joe, I think, that, we're... and that's horrible. Beautiful too. Joe. Yep. Good old Joe. Um, so it is. Those are my two, Neil. Those are my two pieces of advice. I think they're great. Uh, a couple other thoughts are like, don't try and game things. Like if you think something's timely and I'm going to pounce on this, your yep. book's going to come out through two, three, five years from now. Yeah. So back to Denise's point, yep. find a story that you really care about that you can really live with and, and, and share your passion for that story over the long haul. Um, I think it's important too to find story and character and not just a topic like thanksgiving could be the history of thanksgiving could be a topic right sarah josepha hale and her story and 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 this idea of gratitude in america that's a story yeah um and um and i think uh, i guess another more nerdy piece is uh once you find a story that you care about and you think you're onto something make sure the information is going to be there <laughs> um, <this> is, <laughs> Oh, yeah, that. They taught me that in college of like, make sure your research, you can actually find research on what you're, yeah. what you're looking advice for. <laughs> I haven't really followed myself necessarily, but it <laughs> helps to know that there's archival materials or so-and-so's papers or that you can get the stuff that you're going to need to bring that story alive. Yeah, totally. Excellent. Well, then I think this is a great question to end on. Again, I would love to hear both of your perspectives on it on what did this book teach you either about yourself as a writer a nerdy little gem of a fact um or just you know history or yourself or 
what did this book teach you? Which I'm sure is different for both of you, um, having different perspectives on it. So, Neil, do you have one while Denise is thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Neil, go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I will go first, and and it's a really good question. And it's and it's a tricky it's one. A very I, good I question. It's a very good question. Very good question. A bunch of you know, a bunch of small, like smaller, lowercase things um, about these different characters. Um, obviously about Thanksgiving itself, but I think I, I learned something about America's resilience. Um, you, you know, um, Damn, I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> God, you that's, borrow a it? that's a good answer. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, sorry to have stolen it from you. Shit. <laughs> oh, keep going. Whatever. <laughs> but it's, it's true. And, and, <laughs> And, you know, especially now we're, we're reading all this crap in the news day in and day out. And to read a story that reminds us that we're tougher than we think, maybe, and, and we care about each other more than we think, that resilience piece is um, hopeful and inspiring at a time when I wasn't always feeling so hopeful. I love that. That's great. Another reason to buy this book. Totally. I I love that cover. too, and 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 thank you. And I, when I was working on it, I did find it was it was this small, these like just small moments of grace that I would come across in a story about Thanksgiving at an orphanage or um, a, a bomber coming home after uh, World War II to spend Thanksgiving with his mother. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't about the grand gesture, you know, it, it was about these, these small moments of caring and um, resilience is a great way to put it, but also just, Thanks. Take, just taking a, a moment to say, uh, you know, with everything else that's going on in the world right now, and in this book, three different, you know, we, 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 the Civil War, World War, World War I and World War II are all in this book. And just seeing people figure out a way, no matter how small, to just take a minute to say thank you for something with other people, no matter how horrible things were looking. And that to me is as, timeless a, a lesson a sentiment as as you can as you can find and something that goodness knows we need right now um it, it's hard and but the thing is those little those little moments of grace really can propel you forward and sustain you and i like to think that you know as Lincoln said, you know, the ability to do that really does just demonstrate the, the better angels of our nature. Yeah. I nice. love where that ended. You know, it's just so good. No, but truly, like sometimes events, you're just like, and we're going to end there because we're at time. But, like, this had such a nice flow to it. So thank you both for ending us on such wonderful, hopeful thoughts. Thank you for the gift of this book, Denise. Thank you, Neil, for the gift of your time and those kind questions. And thank you, just, Neil. thank you so much for a wonderful event. I want to encourage everyone that they can get signed copies of We Gather Together at tatteredcover.com or at, at any of our locations in the Denver metro area. So you guys can pick up your copy. And um, I want to give each of you a moment to remind people who you are, where they can find you online, and any other last minute thoughts uh, you have before we close out? Neil, will you start us off and then we'll end with our author of the hour? Sure. Um, and thank you for hosting this. Thanks to Tattered Cover. And uh, for those listening, I hope you'll buy the book and buy it from Tattered Cover. Um, or if you're watching from somewhere else, get it at your local- Local indie. indie. Yep. Um, I'm an author. You mentioned in the beginning of the, uh, the conversation that I published five books. I've got another one coming out. It'll either be late next year or early the following year. There's a lot of information about my books and my uh, journalism at neilthompson.com. Um, I dabble on Instagram, not so much on Twitter or Facebook, but um, uh, yeah, find me on Instagram, follow me or uh, shoot me a note on my website. Thanks for reading guys. And Denise. 
Thank you so much to, well, to Neil, thank you. Oh. Uh, and, and also, and thank you, to, thank you, Michaela, and thank you, Tattered Cover. I have such great memories of your store and I can't wait to be back there in person again, but I'm so glad you guys were willing to do this. Absolutely. Uh, you, you can read about my, um, my books, my, um, my books and my journalism. And uh, I, I host an author co conversation series called Crack. We brought that up. It's awesome. Yes, it's fun. And it's is it on YouTube awesome. or is it a podcast? What is it? it? On I host it on Crowdcast and then post them all on YouTube. Nice. Um, so it's Craft Authors in Conversation. And it's basically kind of similar to tonight, but not necessarily as focused on a book. Might be a whole hour just talking about like how you read it's nerd, it's nerd central in a lot of ways. Nice. Hey. Used to have it in person um, and at a local cocktail bar here in Asheville and a craft cocktail was created by one of the owners of the bar that was inspired by whoever the guest author was. That's really cool. And they're, still, and they're, still doing them. they're still doing them for me and I'm just posting the recipes online, which is not quite the same as being in their bar and drinking them while you're talking. But um uh, all, all about you know craft and my books and and my tour most of the information is you know like it's my website's the best place to go first which is denisekiernan.com um i'm on instagram and my links to all those things are on my website too i'm on instagram mo more than anything else um i do some twitter and some facebook i'm just not as diligent about it as i should be um but, uh, but, but yeah, that's, that's where I am. That's where you can find me. Excellent. And I'm McKaylee with Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver, Colorado. Again, we encourage you to get your copy from, of We Gather Together from your local independent bookstore or online with us at tatteredcover.com. We can at least guarantee some signed copies for you all. And we just want to say thank you again for continuing to support local independent bookstores, continuing to support local businesses. For a lot of you right now, it's dinner time. So maybe think about ordering from a local mom and pop restaurant. Um, so we thank you guys again, because during these tumultuous times, we would not still be here without you and without your continuous support. Denise and Neil, if you'll hang on here um, while I close this out. I just want to thank everyone again and just you can get your copies of We Gather Together online or in our stores at Tattered Cover. And we thank you guys so much. Stay safe and happy reading. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. And we're out. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>